Yeah, well, thanks, David. Thanks for having me here. I've, I've spoken at a few of these events. It's always a bit unnerving to be uh, speaking on a topic where nearly everybody in the audience knows more about it than you do, but um, I'll try and not be too discouraged. So this is the view of uh, uh, primarily a resource economist um, looking at, uh, at these problems of climate change in general and trying to figure out how that fits into uh, the problems of coral reefs as I've managed to pick up uh, a view of them from uh, talking with people like Terry from reading the literature and so forth. So that's me. I have lots of uh, websites and blogs uh, to uh, keep my uh, keep in contact with the public and so forth. So if you ever want to uh, see what I'm up to in general terms, particularly on climate change, you can visit those sites. Uh, Google will find me pretty easily if you uh, don't want me to want to take those down now. So first, the, the basic problem of climate change. Um, well, of course, uh, caused primarily by emissions of greenhouse gases, of which the most important, but uh, not the only one by any means, is, is carbon dioxide. Uh, we've seen already uh, an increase in global temperatures of about 0 0.8 degrees relative to, the, uh, uh, relative to what appears to be the pre-industrial average. Uh, on, top of climate, on top of temperature increase, which is a fairly straightforward uh, physical process at its basis, uh, there's a bunch of much more complicated uh, issues that the climate scientists are, are still working about. First, uh, certainly, if you change temperatures, you change rainfall patterns. But uh, beyond that simple statement, it's, it's much more difficult to work out, well, how will you change rainfall patterns? My main area of work is uh, in the Murray-Darling Basin and both the models and recent experience suggest uh, significantly drier, uh, not only in the Murray-Darling Basin, but throughout that temperate, uh, temperate band of latitudes uh, which uh, a lot of agriculture relies on. On the other hand, the, um, uh, the general picture uh, of most analysis is, is that certainly tropical Australia and more generally tropical areas are likely to experience increased rainfalls. Uh, also, as already been mentioned, there's a lot of work still pretty vigorously disputed about, about uh, cyclones. Uh, the best bet appears to be fewer but more intense, but uh, yeah, that's still, I think, uh, something that is not at all uh, well understood, and uh, we're still waiting on, on data on those things. But certainly, those things have a bunch, of, um, a bunch of implications, obviously, for coral reefs. Well, first, I don't need to tell anybody high temperatures cause bleaching events. I mean, it's interesting that um, Certainly, uh, yeah, my recollection at the time of the, the first big bleaching event was it was yeah, it took quite some time before people settled down on on, on this as the as as the sole explanation eliminated the uh, eliminated uh, the, the other suspects. And this, I think, is a problem for all of us engaged in this climate science debate that uh, uh, we need to uh, we need to be honest about these uncertainties while recognising the fact that we're dealing with people a large number of participants who aren't in the least bit honest and who are quite keen to seize on any uh, uncertainty uh, that we might mention to say, well, let's just wait and see, let's just wait until we've got all the uncertainties resolved, uh, and then, uh, probably from five metres or so inland, uh, we'll try and uh, see what we should do about the problem. Uh, also, of course, uh, acidification uh, with, um, uh, with uh, big implications for uh, coral reefs in particular, and I think yeah, Terry mentioned wicked problems. What you see is you pump the carbon dioxide out, what we were saying, all the people, terrestrial type people, uh, looking at this problem in the early 90s was, well, fortunately, a whole bunch of it goes in the oceans where it doesn't do any harm. Well, I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, I guess, of course, it all turns into um, carbonic acid. Uh, sometimes some marine organisms benefit from that, but in the process of benefiting, as far as I can tell, they pump the carbon dioxide straight back into the atmosphere and, uh, and we're back where we started. So, uh, so this is the kind of characteristic of, well, one, one feature of a wicked problem is if you overstress a system, it's going to break down somewhere. If you fix up the breakdown in one place, uh, it will break out somewhere else. And, and as an economist, we have plenty of experience with that kind of thing. So um, what are the trajectories? Well, the starting point, I guess, is business as usual. And it's still, you know, I think the, the risk that the world will go for business as usual has declined markedly in the last few years. I think there's uh, a, a very good chance that we'll have, have a sustainable policy. But the fact is, so far, all we have is intentions. Uh, Kyoto produced some useful gestures from the wealthy countries, but didn't really move us off the, um, off the business as usual, the highest of the business as usual trajectories for the world as a whole, as, as was shown yesterday. 
a steady increase in temperatures of three degrees or more. Uh, I'm obviously a much less expert on this than anybody else, but it seems to me pretty clear from what I've read that if we go that way, uh, there's no point very much in talking about uh, other actions we might take to improve the sustainability of coral reefs. The, the ecosystems as we know them uh, will all be at a minimum radically transformed, typically to simpler and, and less appealing to people uh, systems. Of course, there'll be something there. The planet will still be there and life will continue, but uh, coral reefs as we know them won't be. On the other hand, um, uh, we now look at the optimistic story, which is mitigation and stabilisation, the typical typically expressed either as a, um, a target for um, emissions or as a target for temperature. And since the climate scientists are still trying to work out what the, uh, what the sensitivity of the climate is, there's still a fair range of error. Those two, those two targets are different kinds, of, uh, different kinds of targets. Emissions are what we can actually control, broadly speaking. Temperatures are what we want to achieve. But um, so the targets uh, in emissions terms, the plausible ones involve uh, very substantial reductions in emissions by 2050, typically the order of 90% of, uh, or so for, for developed countries, and all of this aimed at a target of, of holding temperature increases below 2 degrees C, that's still very clearly a very substantial source of stress for coral reefs. So uh, that's the scenario when most of us, certainly thinking about um, world food supplies and things, broadly speaking, I mean, there are some there are some more pessimists than others, but broadly speaking, as an agricultural economist, when I think about two degrees of warming, I think, well, that's it. Yeah, we've saved the planet and we can go home. Uh, that's obviously not the case as it, um, as it, relates, to, uh, as it relates to coral reefs, that uh, two degrees of warming on top of, uh, you know, added, added on to the existing state of the coral reefs would be highly destructive. I should briefly mention, I haven't said much about the economics of this. Uh, uh, the nice feature of the story is all of this is incredibly affordable, a typical estimate would be that uh, achieving this kind of goal, if we could all agree on it and achieve it in the most efficient way, would reduce the economic growth rate by 0.1 to 0.2 percentage points, would mean, for example, that whereas on our standard projections, which are, have wildly larger sources of error in them than this, we might hope to double our income by uh, roughly sometime in the 2040s, uh, on the most urgent of, of approaches that are being considered, it might take us till 2050 to double our income instead. So it's consistent with steadily rising living standards, and that's um, crucial in terms of understanding the debate, but it's also crucial in terms of framing issues of resilience and how to, how to tackle them. So here's a picture of the kind of emission story where currently, as we've seen, we're currently well and truly tracking this path. We have to take action starting from 2012, much more radical action than has been, been taken so far, uh, starting with uh, adoption at least immediately by the developed countries of emissions trading schemes. I think the experience, you know, the reason I have optimism is uh, experience, experience in Europe, will sh uh, and I'm sure it will be replicated elsewhere, will show once we have these schemes in place, the targets will be surprisingly easy to achieve. That's been the experience of similar schemes uh, at for local pollutants like sulphur dioxide. Uh, the Americans introduced an emissions trading scheme uh, they found that they achieved the targets at a fraction of the cost that they budgeted for and were able to tighten those targets up a, as time went on. So I think once we get, if, if we can get past the typical national interest argy-bargy uh, that goes on at these things, we do have a good chance of being on one of these lower, lower uh, scenarios. I'm not going to talk about the upper scenarios because quite honestly, if that's the, if that's the scenario we go on, then you know, coral reef ecologists are pretty much out of business. There is really you know, no hope under business as usual. And I think that's you know, a message which I think is, is going out and which you, know, you need to be mobilised uh, in the front line of, of uh, resistance to those who advocate business as usual or wait and see, which comes down to pretty much the same thing. But critically, there's no guarantee, even with mitigation and stabilisation. Uh, the cumulative um, impact of local and global threats is uh, very likely to damage or degrade a large proportion of the world's coral reefs uh, including uh, potentially those in developed countries such as Australia. Uh, and the severity of both of these threats is going to increase over coming decades in the absence of management response. So I, I want to introduce, I suppose, the only really original idea in this talk is the idea of a window of transition. And that is that if we can get through to 2050 without losing major assets, the situation is going to become steadily more favourable from that point onwards in a number of respects. First, with strong mitigation, 
at this point we'll start to see uh, climate stabilising. There's, of course, a long lag between emitting CO2 and, um, and, and the complete stabilisation of the climate, but if we can get the right kinds of policies, we should have pretty much stabilised atmospheric levels of CO2 by 2050. We may well be in a position uh, to even see uh, in interventions both in the form of um, uh, creating additional sinks or possibly technological in interventions which would actually reduce CO2 to levels, uh, put them on a path back towards pre-industrial levels. Global population will also stabilise or peak under current projections. Uh, we're still, yeah, we've seen a substantial uh, decline in global birth rates. The, the rate of addition to the population has, has at least uh, uh, slowed down, so we've got the second derivative right, but, um, uh, but we, we, by 2050, under plausible circumstances, we'll have a stable world population. Further, uh, we'll see substantial economic development and this is a complicated story, so I, I want to try and get it right. Uh, economic development, in essence, is good for the environment. That is, people, if they're wealthier, are much more willing to give up a little bit of that wealth to protect the environment than, uh, uh, than uh, people who are poor. If you're poor, uh, you know, if your kids are hungry, the fact that the fish you, you catch today won't be available in, in five years' time is a problem for five years' time. It's not, uh, you yeah, know, you're going to go, go straight out and catch that fish and let five years' time take care of itself. Now, it's important to get this right because there's nothing automatic about this. It's only if people, as they become wealthier, push for these kinds of, of things that they'll happen, but we have the resources to make them happen. So we can see that, for example, in the 60s and 70s, uh, countries like the US started to become much more conscious of the environment, started to engage in environmental protection of local issues. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union and places like that where people had no voice, uh, the policy just kept on develop developing in more and more destructive sorts of ways. So there's nothing automatic about it. But again, without improvements in underlying ability of people to sustain themselves, we're not going to succeed in mobilising concern about, uh, about coral reef ecologies. Either even for their future benefits for humans, let alone for uh, more intangible values like biodiversity. But plausibly, if we, if we uh, see a continuation of the improvements in living standards and, and if we as a world uh, improve the way in which we, um, we try and spread those benefits more widely, and I think there are hopeful uh, steps in both directions, uh, by 2050 we shouldn't be in the situation of trading off uh, today's survival against tomorrow's sustainability. So here's the, some examples of the UN population projections. Um, yeah, they vary a bit, but I think the likelihood is, yeah, the most likely is, um, is this green one where the population pretty much stabilises around 9 billion, a bit over a 30% a odd increase on what we have now. Uh, that's certainly a, a population that can be fed with the available technology, used sensibly and sustainably. It can be, yeah, we, we can sustainably feed that global population and uh, we, uh, yeah, if we can stabilise population at that level uh, and see a gradual decline thereafter, uh, the task of stabilising, a task of feeding the world without overstressing the resources of the planet is one which we can resolve in, this, in these coming decades. So, second sort of idea, not very original, but, but one that you know, other people have mentioned already, but I think is, is absolutely critical, is no matter what we do, certainly no matter what Australia does, but even no matter what plausible action the world takes, uh, we're still going to have substantial uh, stress from, from global warming and climate change uh, on coral reefs. Uh, the only thing we can do about this locally is to improve, resilient, is to improve the resilience of reefs uh, and the, um, uh, the best uh, set of tools for that are, are those that reduce those local stresses, which of course have already degraded large numbers of reefs without any requirement for much additional input from climate change. So, so we've got a whole bunch of of stresses that uh, uh, that already apply to that are already endangering uh, reefs and of course other natural ecosystems that are under threat. The more we can reduce those threats, the more likely it is that um, uh, that systems can bounce back uh, from shocks such as bleaching events uh, more severe than usual, cyclones and so forth, and return to something approximating uh, their their original state. I won't try and get into definitions of resilience here, but broadly speaking we see a return to something like the previous state rather than a transition uh, to particularly drastically simplified, uh, for example, an algal dominated reef, reef system. So I've got a little pictures here which are supposed to, um, the idea is uh, here's climatic stress on this axis. We see business as usual, it just keeps on 
it keeps on going up and um, uh, if we can um, if we have low initial resilience even with mitigation and stabilization we, we, we reach this transition before we've stabilized the um, before we've stabilized the system so we we uh, we can see under the mitigation and stabilisation scenario the climate stress gradually declines, but it's too late because the system has already has already collapsed. On the other hand, with high additional resilience, uh, we can see that we get you know my picture we just got by. We, we we the system is under stress, but but survive, but but survives long enough thanks to the thanks to its initial resilience uh, to be maintained. Then, as the stress from uh, climate change is gradually withdrawn. Uh, we see some kind of recovery. So that's the kind of picture I have in mind when I think about, uh, uh, think about improving resilience as a strategy. So um, I won't go too long over this slide, all the usual th good things that are being done in the Great Barrier Reef uh, are, are, are plausible. The big problem I think is the global problem uh, where we have to address food security needs, uh, much larger groups of people and um, uh, in terms of climate change, what this links to is contract, converge and comp compensate. What that means, contract and converge means that uh, everybody in the world by 2050 should have the same entitlement, a low entitlement to emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, compensate means that uh, we need to help poor countries bear the much greater cost of this. Uh, rich countries need to help poor countries. So uh, a little plug for the Coral Triangle. This is just a few places. And, um, uh, yeah, this picture, just to illustrate the kind uh, which I've taken from Terry, the kind of magnitude of the problem to illustrate. Yeah, we have, we certainly have plenty of challenges in Australia. Trying to deal with these problems in the typical coral reef environment uh, is much more challenging. It's a huge uh, economic and social issue, of which I hope to hear more. So I hope I haven't gone too far over.